This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 746, recorded on April 20, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent and everybody else. Um, I'm looking out my window now, wondering why I'm here rather than on some pescatorial destination, but I'm not. Um, I, I've been too busy to fish. Do you believe that? A man of my age, too busy to fish. It can't be right. But uh, at any rate, I'm uh, happy to be here. And uh, the weather is absolutely delightful. Lovely. Sunny and 22 Celsius. It's fabulous. Also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's sleeting, which you could call snow, <laughs> rain, a little of both. It's three degrees <laughs> Celsius. <laughs> and uh, I did since I did Celsius first, mm. uh, 38 Fahrenheit. You can keep that weather there if you don't mind. Yeah, I'm sure it's <laughs> coming your way. No. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, um, I have the same weather that Dixon and Vincent have, um, 73, sunny and gorgeous. And I'm a little sad to hear from Kathy that I may have something else tomorrow. Who knows? Last time people really enjoyed your cats, uh, Brianne and Alan's uh -huh. cats walking around. People said, <laughs> right. oh, nice to see the cat show. <laughs> nope. <laughs> That's cute. Uh, today is um, Tuesday and... That means we're going to do some basic virology for you. We have a paper and a snippet. Oh, my gosh. It's like shades of days gone by, a paper and a snippet. How about that? Um, we, we can live for this. Vincent. We can we go back. This. We can go back to our former things. This is true. We, we just recorded a twin this week in neuroscience, by the way, with a professor from Yale who found out that C. elegans can respond to pigmented things and light, yes. even yes. though they don't yes. have yes. eyes, they don't have they That's don't have right. opsins, they don't have any of that, but they have proteins that somehow respond and they don't know how. Do. It's probably wavelengths, don't you think? Uh, Vibration, wave. Vibrational wavelengths. I don't know, they have no idea, but the protein involves, or stress proteins. So a whole ah. new area opened up, very cool. Right. Very exciting. But they can avoid toxins that way, though. That's why. Yeah, that's exactly. Why because it turns right. out that many, many bacteria that secrete toxin are also pigmented, yeah. right? That's right. So I, I read this guy's. Um, it's in science. Report. You must have seen yeah. the paper in science. I did. Yeah. It's, it was fantastic. And was he fantastic. was very good. He, he's really right. a very interesting guy. Michael, I can't remember his name, but uh, <laughs> he, he's a professor at Yale and he lives in Manhattan. He commutes, oh, which. Goodness. Reminded me of Yordi Casals, who used to do that. He used to live in the yes, neighborhood here and commute right, to that's Yale. Right, that's right. That's right. And that's why when he got Lassa fever in the lab, <sighs> yes. he was put in the hospital here. Oh, you know this story, Dixon. No, no. Jordi <laughs> Casals wasn't in the hospital here. Yes, he was. He was in the, according to fever, so. he was in the hospital here, and they treated him with Penny Pinio serum, and she had been I hospitalized. I didn't realize he was here. here. I didn't realize he yes, was here. I'm sorry. He was here. You don't have to apologize. I see. He okay. was treated with Penny Pinio's serum, who had yes, been treated yes, no, no. here. That I do know. Radical. Uh, so solution. I told Michael the story, and he was totally uninterested. <laughs> <laughs> How can you not be interested in that? All right, today we're going to talk about viruses in your brain. We're going to do a paper uh, that was just, I don't know when it was published. A last year, year. ago, so this, is, this was on my list, mm -hmm. pre-COVID list. And uh, I was going through it the, uh, the other day saying, okay, let's, let's get a cool paper. And this was on my list. It doesn't matter how old it is, but it's very cool. It is encephalitic alpha viruses exploit... Uh, Sorry, I couldn't resist. Exploit caviola-mediated transcytosis at the blood-brain barrier for central nervous system entry. The authors are Salimi Kane, Jang Roth, Beattie, Sun, Klimstra, Hu, and Klein from Was Washington University School of Medicine and the University of Pittsburgh. And, uh, the, you know, a number of viruses get in the brain. Not all of them do, obviously, but some of them do. And um, 
This is an interesting process because the brain is very nicely protected. Uh, I have a lovely photo here. Not a photo, actually. It's a, uh, oh, I, I don't think I can share it. Let me try. Mm, I'm using an external monitor here. No, I don't want to end the meeting. That's the wrong button. No, 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 no. I want to. Danger, danger, danger. <laughs> so stupid. Oh, you just ended it. Did I? Well, no. you disappeared. No, you're, you're still here. Do you see this image? Yes. yes. Yeah, well, that's that's in the show notes, though. Yes. Yeah, but, but it's, it's also shared on our Zoom screen. I want to show it to right. people, but I have no idea what's recording now because this is all for cocktail. But anyway, <laughs> this is a this is an image from Principles of Virology. You know, the, oh. the brain is and the spinal cord have a lot of blood vessels in them. And so there's um, you know, what we call the blood brain barrier that is keeping things inside from getting out unless they have to. And here's the legend capillaries within the CNS comprise tightly packed endothelial cells, which you can see here. Let's look at the, at the blow up. Um, brain microvascular endothelial cells uh, and uh, astrocytes. Well, they also have pericytes around them, little flat cells there. And then around the whole thing is an astrocyte foot process. And this barrier prevents free access of blood-borne proteins and cells from the blood to the brain termed the blood-brain barrier, although this barrier is permeable to activated lymphocytes. You can see a, a T-cell squeezing through. And those of you who are driving, I'm sorry, but we're just showing a, a capillary in the in the CNS and how uh, it's very well protected. And in addition, you know, the junctions between the uh, endothelial cells have tight junction proteins, which makes, makes it hard for things to squeeze through. So it's a very cool thing. So... I just want to interject here because when we were uh, in the throes of our blood-brain barrier research on <laughs> mouse adeno, uh, we ended up writing a review article and we were compelled to distinguish between the blood-brain barrier and the neurovascular unit. And mm. this paper that we're going to discuss also talks about the neurovascular unit. What is the neurovascular unit? Yeah, what is that? So the uh, let's start with the blood-brain barrier. It's the interface between the brain and the peripheral circulation composed of specialized capillaries and adjoining cells. Right, which and I just showed you, a, which, which I just showed you a picture of, right? That would right, be that. but in a way you kind of also showed the neurovascular unit because the neurovascular unit is an association of endothelium, extracellular matrix, astrocytes, pericytes, microglia, and neurons that contribute structurally and functionally to permeability. So neurovascular is kind of all of the cells and the matrix and the blood brain barrier is, is really referring to the interface uh, between the brain and the circulatory. Mm. Okay. So Kathy, how does that relate to the anterior and posterior choroid plexus? <laughs> well, the choroid plexus <laughs> is something that is also discussed in this paper. It's not one of the um, CVOs, which they never spell out. So I had to, look it up to be sure, the, is a circumventricular organ. And the choroid plexus is not one of those um, because it lacks neural tissue. So I, I haven't exactly answered your question, but... But it's a barrier nonetheless though, right? It, it is. Um, uh, yeah, I guess it's a barrier. I, I think of it as being rather porous, but I don't really, I, I'm on thin ice here, sorry. <laughs> Especially with today's weather. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, so if you if it's a vir if you're a virus and you're going to get into the brain from this circulation, uh, you have to do some things that um, to to circumvent this, obviously, and for, that includes well, you could bypass this entirely and just get in the brain via nerves, right? It could infect a T cell and get in. You could get in a, sure, a T could. cell. You could. Mm -hmm. You could destabilize mm -hmm. the junctions, the tight junctions of the uh, right. endothelial cells, or mm -hmm. you could pass right through the the uh, endothelial cells. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, then, then they note that cavioli, which is not a pasta, it is a, a vesicle. <laughs> That's cavatelli. <laughs> <laughs> cavioli are uh, cavioli. <laughs> Cavioli are, are flasks, indentations of the plasma membrane that eventually become 
vesicles and be, and kind of move into the cell uh, via the endocytic pathway. Caviolin uh, mediated endocytosis as opposed to uh, clathrin mediated endocytosis, and they can move materials uh, through these cells as well. So, Vincent, a lot of uh, uh, wandering macrophages go from tissue to tissue by a process called diapodesis. Yeah, I love that word. I, I love do too. It. I love using it, although I've, <laughs> I have not forgotten the meaning. <laughs> I used to use it. So that's it, another uh, way to get through, right? Yeah, and, and most likely yeah. um, that T cell um, also uh, moved diapodesis. Yeah. Yes. Well, the squeezing through, yeah, <laughs> diapodesis. Yeah. Yeah. So... And we're not talking about squeezing between cells. We're talking no, about through, squeezing right, right through. through the cell. Yeah. You got well, it. That, well, diapodesis no, is, is between. Is between. Yeah. It's between. Well, okay. I thought it was, yeah. I thought it was through. No, okay, so, so if diapodesis between. is between, then T cells can also do the right through the middle thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Right. They fuse their membrane, then unfuse it and go through and then fuse it again and go out. I'm not sure of the no. mechanism, but there is some evidence, I think, I, again, readers can correct me, uh, listeners right. can correct me, but right. that T cells can go right through cells, not just Interesting. between. Interesting. Um, it, uh, I, I did a lot of work on a nurse cell complex in muscle tissue where cells were going in and out all the time. Yeah. And we had markers for... Um, to identifying whether it's a macrophage or a neutrophil or an eosinophil and stuff like this. As soon as a cell goes through into the nurse cell, at least, they lose their surface markers. So they lose their identity, basically, as, mm -hmm. they, they, as they squeeze through by whatever mechanism they were going. I, I assumed I have a desis, but I wasn't sure. So um, very interesting stuff. So if you're a virus stuck to the outside, let's say you had the right receptor and you hadn't quite infected the cell, could you still get it? through the blood-brain barrier that way. So, so I think that this has come up before, but I'll just ask Vincent to expand upon it. Um, why would a virus be doing this and going to the brain and crossing the well, blood-brain blood barrier? I think, I think it's completely accidental. Did you say why? No, <laughs> yeah, I understand. I did. <laughs> there are no uh, why I, questions. So I think it's accidental <laughs> because, yes, there is, in humans anyway, that's uh, right. There's, there's, it's a dead end, right? You, uh, yeah. Once you get in, it's like a roach trap, right? A roach a jail. Yeah, roach um, roach jail. Now, in animals, of course, if if animals eat each other, then right. you know that could be transmitted through there. So maybe this is a remnant because these are largely zoonotic infections, right? Where humans are dead end infections. Now, is this polio the, virus. Sorry. Poli yeah, wait, okay. polio virus is a human virus, and it still gets in. But it does so rarely, you know, 1% of infections. And I think it's an accident that happens because the receptors are in the right places and, and so forth. But that's why I object to them saying viruses have evolved mechanisms to bypass this because I don't think right. that's correct. In any case, they, things are just selected uh, because right. there's no, you know, there's no intention. But, you know, but I think the humans are accidental hosts. So the why question is hard because maybe in animals it's important to... Is this the only it. tissue that this virus infects? That's what I was going no, to ask. No, not at all. Not at all, no. That's what I thought. So, you know, in other tissues it could be picked up. Uh, how is it transmitted? Well, anyway? you know, it gets into the blood and then <laughs> it's in the it's in the blood-brain barrier, and right? It's got to cross. And if it's got well, the right... If it's in the right cell, it has the right, the receptors it's, are there or whatever. Uh, sure. I mean, as we'll it's see. Not a, it's uh, not an arbovirus though, right? I mean, it's not transmitted well, by an we, insect vector. Yes, anything, yes. Is these, the viruses yes. in well, these. They are, they are, they are. They yes, are, these okay. are all arboviruses for sure. Ah, okay, okay. So they are, they're entering the blood. Um, there but, you go. So they mentioned this, uh, that some viruses uh, actually compromise the, the blood brain barrier permeability and when I teach virology, I always give the example of West Nile virus, which um, uh, when you're infected, it is sensed by TLR3, toll-like receptor 3, and that, among other things, ends up producing tumor necrosis factor alpha, which loosens up, at least in mice, it loosens up the BBB and allows the virus to get in. Because if you, if you make mice lacking TLR3, it's harder for the virus to get into the brain because no no TNF is made or less TNF is made. So that's an interesting one. And then they say other viruses, which include the encephalitic alpha viruses, that's the viruses we're talking about here, Venezuelan, Western and Eastern equine encephalitis viruses, 
V-E-E-V, W-E-E-V, and E-E-E-V can enter the CNS directly from the blood via unknown mechanisms. That's what they want to figure out in this paper. Vive, weave, and eve. Because <laughs> it's too long to say them, right? Mm -hmm. So Dixon, these uh, cycle between yes. mosquitoes and birds for eve yep. and weave. Yep. Yep. Mosquitoes and rodents for vive. Okay. Or mosquitoes and horses for vive, you know. Got it. Yep. Equine yep. encephalitis. <laughs> We're calling um, them by another name, but that's true. North, Central, and South America. And in humans, you know, you can get encephalitis, and that's not good. Absolutely. Um, vive, they say, is the most important zoonotic pathogen. Um, but there's, there are not a lot of cases. But, um, you know, as they say, the mosquito expansion... Uh, might change that as temperatures rise and so forth. So I thought they were flaviviruses, though, actually. No, th these are alpha mm. viruses. No, I understand that, but I, th I thought... What? Okay. No, those are not flavies. That whole other group was flavi uh, for some reason. Yeah, like West why. Nile and dengue. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yellow fever. <coughs> exactly. Zika. They're different. Dengue. Dengue. But mm -hmm. they're both Dixon plus stranded RNA viruses. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's probably where you got it. <laughs> yeah, they're both plus stranded true. RNA. They're oh, I'm sure I had that buried in my psyche. <laughs> and they have spikes. Dixon, they have spikes. But, but, you know, the spikes of flavies are flat on the surface of the particle. Oh, okay. And these are, okay. are perpendicular. Yeah. Which is just a Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I was going to say, strangely enough, I taught my students um, right before this that all arboviruses are not related. Um, and that's not a taxonomic class. So um, <laughs> exactly as you're saying, Dixon, you know, we've got a couple different types of viruses, flaviviruses, and alpha Indeed. viruses. There's yeah, also so a these, DNA arbovirus. Yes. yes. Oh my right. goodness. Do that's these right. viruses also infect the insect vector? Yeah, they do. Or they're just paratonic they uh, no, carriers. So, so paratonic. they do, so they're promiscuous. They're really promiscuous. Well, yes, that's actually an interesting issue, right? You have to be able to reproduce in the mosquito and in the mammalian exactly, host. Exactly, that's exactly, tough. exactly. And uh, actually, uh, Kathy, I, last night we had a office hours because today they get the exam, mm -hmm. final exam, and I used one of your questions. <laughs> Did arboviruses <laughs> start in arbo? <laughs> Mississippi. Oh, and, and we had that on <laughs> our exam that was, that was yesterday as well. <laughs> it's a very funny question. Yes. Uh, but it's a, you know, we tell them it's, uh, it's not really open book, but, you know, if they were to Google that place, they would find that it exists in Mississippi and then they might just they might go do from it there. as an answer. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this, um, so, yes, yeah, so we have these three arboviruses that cycle between different mosquitoes. I'm not sure what the mosquitoes are, actually. I didn't check. Does anyone know offhand? Mm, I don't I remember. Don't. Yeah, I don't remember. Anyway, the, they're, they're very nice models uh, to study in the laboratory. And in this paper, they want to know how these viruses cross the blood-brain barrier, and they use a mouse model. And I thought it was a nice combination of uh, technology and virology. Um, I heard, actually, Robin... Klein speak here a couple of years ago. Very interesting stuff. Very good mm -hmm. stuff. All right. So um, the first is to uh, let's, let's establish this model. They infect mice with Vive or Weave in the foot pad. And then one to three days later, they can find virus in the fore and hindbrain regions of the brain. All right. It's great. Foot pad, boom. It's uh, it's probably going via the blood, I would guess, right? Very high titers of virus, um, and you know they they plateau at some point. So you can initially detect them uh, one to three days, but then they plateau, you know, a few days later, depending on the virus. And they, they, there's a lot of um, reproduction. They actually do plaque assays, just yeah. lovely PFU per gram of tissue. <laughs> um, now, they can measure the um, blood-brain barrier permeability. They, they inject a dye into the mice and watch that go into, I think it's a fluorescent dye, right? Yeah, sodium fluorescein. Mm, sodium fluorescein. And so if the BBB is permeabilized, you can see that getting into the brain. And so at, um, you know, later in infection, um, at the, with the peak uh, peak viral loads, you see the peak uh, brain BBB permeability. 
uh, in the mice. So there's something's going on there. And they also have a, a culture model where they can study permeability, which is pretty cool. They, you can grow cells on a membrane and uh, you can have cells, um, well, you can have um, endothelial cells and infect them and you can measure the, the electrical resistance, right? So if the barrier is intact, there's a good resistance to current. And if it's being loosened, you get, what is it? T-E-E-R, trans-epithelial electrical resistance. Yeah, in this case, it's trans-endothelial electrical sorry. resistance. Yeah. E, endothelial. It depends which cells you're measuring. <laughs> yeah, they put endothelial cells on here. And uh, when and so the control is treating them with tumor necrosis factor, which lo loosens up the, the uh, junctions and more current will go through. Um, but um, if you add uh, virus, and uh, I guess they either have BMECs or astrocytes on these, right? Yeah, so I think they're adding basically to either side of the membrane that's to right, see if they have, e uh, either cell type can be um, affecting this. That's right, because they have a layer of, of uh, endothelial cells on the membrane, and below that on the plastic, they have a layer of uh, astrocytes. So you could infect either one, and they see no change in electrical resistance when they infect them, which is curious, right? Because in the mouse, they saw some permeability changes, but that you know that was later in infection. So who knows uh, what's and, going and on? And just there. to say that other virus infections in this same kind of system, you would see disruption and drop in the tier. Yeah. For example, did you do this with your mouse adenovirus? Oh yes. <laughs> and does it disrupt the BBB? Yes. Mm -hmm. and tear and sodium fluorescein, all that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would assume that West Nile would do something similar. Mm -hmm. Probably, yeah. Um, although, um, you know, in, in, interesting. I guess, these, sorry, these, these, I guess, so it's, it's based on TNF alpha. Um, I don't know what cell types are going to make TNF alpha. I don't know if these well, cells will, right? There, there are other things involved. For instance, if you just disrupt the, the tight junctions with matrix metalloproteinase, mm -hmm. like they talked about MMP9 here, um, then that can also uh, disrupt things. Yep. But remarkably, though, with West Nile, at least, uh, there's only one clinical case per 200 infections. So that doesn't happen all the time. Uh, and in fact, even if you develop symptoms, it doesn't always become neuro West Nile. So there is a, a big difference between uh, how many people are infected, how many people get sick, and how many people have neuro. It's a very small percentage of the total pool of infections. Mm -hmm. And that begs the question, then, why don't they all do it? No, well, it's accidental, right? So low frequency so that's your stochastic. that's your hypothesis and that's probably right that's well i think there right. i think there are specific reasons i think at least for polio virus there's good evidence that so so if you if you take away type 1 interferon receptors in mice then the virus gets in the brain 100% of the time and so i think the people who get brain entry with polio have some suboptimal interferon response i bet if you looked at the people who, who got polio or the oh, ones that get vaccine-associated polio, I bet you'd find SNPs in their interferon genes, but nobody has done that. So oh. maybe it's a similar thing here. Does that make sense, Dixon? Am I making sense? No, it does, of course. Or they could have a concurrent infection of something else which is interfering with that process, and that could prevent it in that sense. Yeah. So well, as Kathy mentioned, these ju tight junctions right between the endothelial cells, there's a lot of proteins in there, and and cleavage of those by proteinases can loosen the junction. They also mentioned that a protein called Claudin-5 uh, is a prominent protein there. And if you, if you, uh, you can delete the gene for that in mice, apparently, and you get uncontrolled uh, leakage across the blood-brain barrier, those mice die perinatally. Um, so they looked at Claudin-5 in um, the tight junctions of animals infected with Vive. Uh, and they see that, you know, six days after infection, you have reduced abundance of Claudin-5. Um, this is six days. So that would be responsible for the increased electrical flow across the junction. But if you look earlier, you don't see an effect on uh, Claudin levels, you know. To, so 
12 hours to four days post-infection. So they say these data suggest that neuroinvasion occurs in the presence of an intact blood-brain barrier. Because remember, early, they don't see effects of the BBB, yet they do find virus in the brain. And that's really the basis for the whole paper, that, that observation, which it ends up being correct, I think. Mm -hmm. So now we come to CVOs. And they really didn't define this. Oh, it's, it's like halfway down this paragraph, this one hematogenous route. If you go down, they do uh, circumventricular organs. Finally, they, they do it down but there. They don't, but they don't put it in parentheses CVO right after that, because that's what I searched for. <laughs> no, they didn't do it in the, in the bolded thing, you know, the, the title right. of this. But if you go down, it, it's a oh, long paragraph. Yeah. I, oh, and I, I may have just, yeah, I may have searched for CVO. Anyway, I couldn't find it, but it is there. Okay. So the question here is to ask whether crossing the BBB could occur by, by virus reproduction in the, all these cells that make up the, um, the NVU. What is it, neurovascular Neurovas unit? Yes, yes. You know, all these acronyms. I'll just talk with initials. <laughs> hey, DDD, okay. what do you think, DDD? I'm DDD, so BBB fits in really well. <laughs> well, she actually isn't BBB. She, I'm not BBB. I used no. to think so also, but I got that wrong. But you're D, D cubed, you know, Dixon? I am. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Um, I, I, but, and I'm VR squared, but that's too hard. That's too Anyway, so they're saying, <laughs> can we see if the virus reproduces in these cells that make up the NVU? So they actually take mouse cells isolated from mice in culture and they do growth curves after infections and they can see all these different cell types in the NVU can be infected, although the kinetics are, are slightly different. And so they, they conclude that maybe there is some restriction uh, of, of replication because some cells reproduce virus better than others. So then they infect mice, they have fluorescently uh, tagged viruses, green fluorescent protein tagged viruses. Uh, and then they can see GFP in the brain. Um, so um, you can, when you infect these vi these these guys, now we're doing intravenous, not foot pad uh, any longer. And then you look in the brain for green fluorescent protein. Um, and you can see many places where the virus is reproducing multiple foci of reproduction throughout the brain, which they say suggests it's getting there through the blood, which I would agree as opposed to nerves where it would tend to be focal, right? Uh, and they say some of these sites overlapped with uh, areas that are the circumventricular organs, but others are in areas that are distant from CVOs. And so that, that's more in support of their idea that um, this is, is getting through uh, the blood vessels. So, um, these these experiments basically show you that uh, the different cells in the NVU have differential susceptibility. Uh, and once the virus is in the blood, it can enter the CNS through multiple places that are not all CVOs, CVOs, circumventricular organs. So we know that it's not entering in the nerves and it's not right. entering through these sort of permeable places, the CVOs. Yeah. So it's it seems as though it's blood. coming in through blood, um, but it's not coming in through a leaky blood vessel. It's too bad, Brianne, your name isn't BBB because this paper could be about you then. <laughs> it, it really could. <laughs> <laughs> BBB. B, what's your middle initial R? R. Yeah. So no, I'm B right back. What does <laughs> R stand for? Ray. R-A-Y R -R or R-E-A-Y? Uh, R A Y E. Wow, there's uh, it's so after many, my grandfather. So many ways to spell names, isn't there? Yes. Okay. Now let's take a look at interferon. And so they they say um, maybe the interferon response is uh, restricting reproduction in the cells of the uh, neurovas NVU. Okay. So they take mice lacking the type one interferon receptor. If there are no mice, they're they're lacking the gene encoding it, so they don't make the receptor. And so those animals will make interferon type one, but it won't, it won't bind, it won't induce a signal. Uh, and and uh, these, these animals are more susceptible to infection. So they have to back off, they have to look at earlier times uh, after infection. But basically when you infect uh, the, the IFNAR mice, you expand the number of cell types that get infected with these various viruses. 
Now, so for example, they say wild type mice infected with the weave, there's no GFP in the, in the uh, endothelial cells or pericytes, the, the cells that surround the endothelial cells, only in neurons. Um, and if in the IFNAR mice, uh, all these cells can be infected. So the, the tropism is expanded by removing this uh, interferon pathway. I was um, just going to say, these yeah. are some beautiful yeah, uh, very fluorescent images. They have just multiple colors and they're really nicely uh, captioned for you, labeled. Um, just amazing. It's very rainbows. pretty, yeah. So they conclude that the, these vir alpha viruses, uh, their, their reproduction in the NVU is restricted by interferon signaling. And that prevents the virus from getting in the CNS by blocking uh, reproduction within the endothelial cells, which is a good defense, right? Mm -hmm. Against uh, traversing. All right, so now let's, they say, let's, let's look at what's going on. Let's take some pictures. So they do some electron microscopy, transmission EM uh, of CNS from mice infected, wild type mice or IFNAR mice infected uh, mice, and they see in the IFNAR mice, which make a lot of virus, they have a lot of virus in the blood, so it probably facilitates what they're going to see. They can see what looks like virus particles on the luminal side of cortical microvessels inside the blood vessel, right? They see what look like virus particles stuck on the walls, um, and they can stain it also with, with antibodies against the viral glycoprotein. And see them there. And they say, well, you know, the, these cells, these endothelial cells, they don't reproduce the virus, so it must be intact virus particles here. So that's where they say now, probably these particles just went across the blood-brain barrier. And now we're, we see them on the inside as free particles. Um, and they, um, they, they, they confirm that by infecting mice with a G GFP labeled virus and looking a day after infection. And they can see uh, virus, uh, these little particles, they can actually see infection of what they believe are astrocytes, which would be you know on the outside of this unit, um, infected in many parts of the brain. So they say this would suggest that the virus crosses the, the blood brain barrier as free virus particles, intact virus particles. And, you know, maybe by transcytosis, where they're taken up into a vesicle that moves across the endothelial cell and comes out the other side. Okay. Sort of like protected trans transport inside a cell. And we should say that's a process that happens naturally in a endothelial cell, right? To move material across. So the virus is just being taken up there. Yeah. And it's not just a process that happens in the brain. That's a process that happens at a lot of different yeah. um, barriers throughout the body. So um, when you were saying before that this crossing into the brain may be accidental, um, perhaps uh, associating with calveoli uh, and being involved in transcytosis may be something that the virus is also doing in some other organ. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, this is just a sort of side thing. I, I, I very much like these experiments because for years we thought about how polio virus gets in the brain and, you know, it can get there. We showed it can get there through nerves for sure, but it also can get there uh, through the blood. And But no one ever did these kinds of experiments. Um, too bad because they're really informative. <clears throat> All right. So, um, you know, as we mentioned earlier, the um, movement of material across these endothelia, so this transcytosis, uh, caviolin, cavioli can be involved in that. These flask-like inv invaginations on the surface of the cell, they can pinch off and become vesicles. And so- I just thought of something, yeah, Vincent. That yeah. would be the shape of the pasta. If cavioli were a pasta, they would be flask-shaped. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this, you imagine a flask, right? You would have more sauce that way. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Somebody I, bursts flavor buns in your mouth. Had pasta, so I had pasta last night. It's so good. Oh, I had pasta with <laughs> fake meatballs. You know the uh, Beyond oh, Beef. Oh, okay, yeah. They were really ah, good. So uh, Beyond Beef. Yeah, they're really good. I like them. There's no prions in them. 
<laughs> no, there are no prions. <laughs> My students are all freaked out about prions, right? And I said, just mine too. <laughs> just get beyond uh, beef or uh, whatever. There's yeah. a several different ones. I really like it actually. Mm -hmm. And if you undercook it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> it's not beef. Dixon, what's in those you, things? Uh, plant you protein? You eat them raw. I have no idea. Well, yeah. it's all plants. Of course it uh, is. Yeah, yes. it's, it's, so I know a little bit about Impossible Burgers. So I don't Impossible, know if that's beef right. is, ex yeah, is yeah. exactly the same, but Impossible Burgers are uh, some potato and some soy and they use leg hemoglobin yes, um, to right. make that's it right. taste like beef um, because it gives it a similar flavor to something that actually has hemoglobin in it. Right. Myoglobin. The only thing, I guess these Actually, are, myoglobin. I, I guess the plants that are, um, <laughs> the plants that are used are farmed, I would guess. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like oh, sure. hemoglobin is with a leguminous plant that's farmed somewhere. Cause I, we were talking in our office hours. What if the deer, the, the deer with chronic wasting disease are contaminating the plants that they use to make these burgers? And no, I think they're farmed. Don't. Vincent, don't go there. <laughs> Please. Such a low we have enough to worry about. Yeah. <laughs> well, the people, there is a paper showing that if you take a plant, you put prions in the soil, they will be taken up into the roots, they'll be in the leaves. And if you feed the leaves yes, to, would. if you inject the leaves right. into animals, you will get prion diseases. So, it, you know. You are absolutely Anyway, back right. to cavioli. Yes, the shape of cavioli yes, would please. be glass -like. Um They say when you culture these endothelial cells, and you add a lot of virus, there's more cavioli at the surface. It's like the virus is inducing the formation of cavioli. And so then they look in mice and they quantify the number of caviola-like structures and they get increased in, in infected mice. And they see this membrane ruffling uh, on the surface of these cells. And so they're thinking maybe this is how the cells are taken up by these cavioli. So they now go back to their transwell culture where they put cells on a membrane. And so they, they have uh, the cells and then they put virus on top for, for just 60 minutes, which would not be long enough for, for the reproduction cycle. And then they remove the, the membrane and they say, how, many, how much virus is in the bottom chamber? And they can find virus down there um, after 60 minutes, which suggests it's being transcytosed right through the cells. So they, they think it's too fast to be replication, which they confirmed in a variety of ways. And when they look at these um, cells by transmission electron microscopy, they can see endosomes in the cells with what look like are virus particles within them. They, they say they look like cavioli, <laughs> cavioli, um, and they can find endosomes. So the, the flask-like structures, they pinch off and they become endosomes and move in and they can see viruses in endosomes, multivesicular bodies and exocytic vesicles. So the, the vesicles go to the other side of the endothelial cell and they fuse and they release the virus particles. It's very cool that you can see all of this, right? Uh, and then finally, they, um, they ask, how is the they can use inhibitors of various pathways. They have inhibit so macropinocytosis. Oh, we talked about this not too long ago, right? Uh, in the shape of, in the shape shifting viruses, uh, macropinocytosis, where a piece, a little bit of the membrane re c comes out and grabs things. Clathrin mediated endocytosis, caviola mediated endocytosis. They have inhibitors that they can use and add to the cultures and say which of these is actually. Uh, the one that's taking up the virus particles. And uh, it looks like it's caviolin-mediated endocytosis, not macropinocytosis, not clathrin-mediated uh, endocytosis. So that's pretty cool that you have inhibitors of specific ones. Um, just a few more. Yeah, I really like that experiment. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I like where they add interferon in and show that that Interferon stimulates the RAC1 and that inhibits the caviolar formation. So right. it makes it as if the, the uh, not just as if, the, the cell actually interferon is, is protecting the cell yes, that's right. by doing that. Which so they, it all worked out. That's how they had, you know, which they found in the IFNAR mice originally. And now this, mm -hmm. yes, it's shown here that the IFNAR treatment actually uh, increases the junction integrity. And, and that kind of makes sense as a good thing for interferon to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
it's a good, it's a nice explanation of how it's protective there, yeah. And so if your interferon is uh, intact, you're going to be protected, which, you know, suggests, as I said before, maybe the people who get CNS infections have a little suboptimal interferon and that lets virus in. Um, then the last experiment, they, they have mice lacking caviolin gene and they infect them. And um, without caviolin, they have less viral titers in the cortex after foot pad infection at one in three days post-infection. Remember, that's the early point where we think the virus is just cr crossing the BBB via this transcytosis. Um, because later, the permeability is also reduced and the virus can go through those as well. So early on, caviolin lacking mice, there's less virus, yet in other organs, the spleen and the blood as well, there's the same amount of virus. So it's suggesting that the virus has trouble getting in without caviolin. And as you might guess, if you put the virus right in the brain of caviolin null mice, there's no difference in uh, reproduction, which is great yeah, control. Putting it in directly. Yeah. 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 So that's the story. And um, the, so these viruses can be brought across the endothelial cells by transcytosis mediated by cavioli. And... Um, We've seen also evidence that interferon protects this barrier as well. Now, you may ask, why is this important? Well, I don't know. No, but you, you already <laughs> asked. <laughs> because we, we need to know how viruses get. I mean, you know, in the end, everyone says, Absolutely. well, maybe we can design inhibitors of this. But I don't think that's really the reason they did this. They want to know how viruses mm -hmm. get across because we have mm -hmm. a poor understanding of that. And I think sometimes you just don't know where the information is going to lead you, but it still needs to be done, right? Mm -hmm. does, any, does anyone have some specific reason why finding this out or is important? Well, I think it, in general, uh, I don't know if this is a specific reason, but I think it, a general thing that's important is to think a little bit more about how frequent is this yeah. as a mechanism? Um, do, you know, all viruses that... Um, cross or do, do, do some large proportion of them all involve cavioli? Um, is, is inducing cavioli you know, important for some other aspect of pathogenesis? I think those are interesting questions um, that we could start to learn as follow-ups from this work. I think an interesting uh, question is also how, how the virus would stimulate um, mm -hmm. you know, the formation of these vesicles in the transcytosis process. And they, they talk about... Um, one of the viral proteins, NSP1, which alone can trigger uh, filopodial-like extensions of the plasma membrane. So maybe that's part of the thing. And so it would be interesting to look at that. So they say, that's you know, good. we we may reveal therapeutic targets or provide insights in the context of other neurological disorders induced by increased transcytosis. So that's beyond viruses. It could be mm -hmm. interesting. Sorry, sorry, Dixon, go ahead. No, no, that's okay. I, I was just going to say that um, if you're a student of cell biology and you have to be in order to be a virologist, then you're fully aware of all the mechanisms that a cell uses to gain, to get stuff. Uh, how insulin gets in, how glucose gets in, how large molecules, how our cells get in. All these are normal pathways and every single normal pathway has been hacked by some group of viruses, every single one of them, because they're there. And by natural selection, with enough mutations, you're going to get somebody that can obviously fit the key into that lock. And I think that's a huge lesson here because cavioli obviously do something normal for cells. And this virus is, well, as long as you're going in, you, you mind taking me too? Yeah, that's right. And, <laughs> you know, oh, tonight is Italian night. Great. Let's go have <laughs> cavioli. <laughs> cavioli. Pizza, pizza. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm truly stunned and amazed and continue to be awed by all of the examples that all you bona fide virologists keep raising as you don't consider this normal, obviously, but these are nature's monkey wrenches that are thrown into normal cellular process to result in an abnormal result. Well, Dixon, I don't know. I don't know about. I mean, our immune system 
evolved to protect us against this. So we're all in this together, right? The virus is a bacteria. I, I <laughs> totally understand so this. So I wouldn't and say it's abnormal. It's not good to get sick when you get no, infected, I, well, but it, I think it, it's it, part it of life. And you know, the turnover of of organisms sure. in the ocean, but it's part of the cycles of no, the, no, no, I, of course. So you know, you're you're looking at a match between virus and and the and the mouse, and advantage virus in this case. That's that's all. I don't know. I think it's all balanced, and it's everything in the long run, everything exists and and goes. Can forward. you imagine what life would be like without diseases? Well, as you used to, you like to say, parasites keep populations in check, right? They do, they do, they do, they do. Otherwise, they do. It, yeah, it would be too many lions on the planet. They'd eat Correct. us. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> you know, living forever is not nature's way of handling uh, recycling. <laughs> no, it's all very so, interesting. It is truly. Anyway, truly, this is uh, a it's a lovely paper. Elegant. It's elegant. The the, um, the methods are great. It's it's. It's um, it's an interesting story, and they they solve this problem. And now, I, oh, there was one thing I wanted to bring up. Of course, all this is done in mice. So, do we have any idea whether any of this happens in people? Um, you know, I think the pathways are conserved, so it's it's likely that they could. However, um, you might one day be able to test it. Right? Um, if someone died, you could look in the brain and see if there's evidence for transcytosis uh, or may, perhaps you could use inhibitors that uh, block aspects that were revealed here and, and so forth. So uh, this is what you can do in a model, but there's always a limitation. Also, just one last point. This is in mBio, so it's open access. So if you want to look at these beautiful immunofluorescence uh, yeah, check images, them out. Check, check them out. out. mBio and the editor-in-chief is Arturo Casadeval. Mm -hmm. All right, I wanted to do a snippet on a paper also published <laughs> in 2019. And um, this is kind of close to what we like to do. It's a PNAS paper. January 2020. Yeah, it's a, like a year ago, more than a year, yeah. yeah. Just made it over the line. <laughs> <laughs> Scientists' Incentives and Attitudes Toward Public Communication by Rose Markowitz and Brossard from uh, Dartmouth College, University of Massachusetts, Amherst, University of Wisconsin-Madison. And um, this is the result of a survey um, to see, you know, what professors think about science communication. You know, they make the point that, um, you know, science communication has increased over the last few decades. People are saying we need more science communication. We need to educate the public more. And of course, in the pandemic, that's really obvious. So they wanted to do a survey uh, and see uh, what was going on. And, you know, this is weird, but I highlight, you know, when I read papers, I highlight them and all my highlighting is gone. What happened? <laughs> Why did it go away? It's fine. But I just don't it's a know. lack of communication. It, it faded with time, Vincent. <laughs> <laughs> it's a remarkable lack of communication. It's a con well, conspiracy to scientists uh, hate talking to the public. Well, the that's actually part. one of the outcomes of this survey. Is they that hate it. They, they don't want to be bothered many because of them they're busy are, thinking about their problems, right? Well, scientists are busy, and they have to write it's grants and publish <gasps> papers to get grants. So they don't get any credit for this, or they're worried about being misquoted and getting yeah. in trouble for getting it wrong. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Or they give an article excerpt to a, a reporter, and then when it comes out, it has nothing to do with what they told them. And they never yeah. run it by the the, uh, the author to make sure that they got it right before they do that. And that's a big mistake. I think that's really the biggest crux that we have. Pet peeves. I think Alan Dove is totally aware of this as well, and he's spoken about that a lot. Yeah, I think there's also a little piece where – Sometimes when uh, one is speaking to a reporter or one is asked for comment, um, there's this question of like me, do I really, am I really someone who knows about this? It, um, you know, am I the best person for them to talk to? And they feel, and sometimes you feel like you're not enough of an expert on something. Um, and I, I will say that in the past year, I've been asked to speak to a lot of reporters and every so often I've thought, Oh, I don't know if I, I know enough about this. And I've, you know, spent a lot of time doing my research before the interview. And then their question will be something to the effect of like, what 
is a virus. Mm. <laughs> like, wait, I got that one. I think I know. Brianne, like, you know a lot leave. more than every reporter, trust me. I, I don't think I needed to, to do much research for that one. <laughs> no. Well, the other, the other side of the coin is that then you have many reporters go to the same people over and over, right? And they have a narrative. And I'm not going to name any names, but the same people get quoted over and over and they have a view of some. And so the, you get the impression that this is how it is. Whereas, as I told one reporter, you know, th there's often no conclusion you can make. If you talk to 10 people and get eight and two, it, it doesn't mean the eight is right. You know, he just didn't, maybe you didn't talk to the right people. That's not how science works. Anyway, this one, they say, you know, many within the scientific community advocate for reinvigorating the public image of science and promoting engagement efforts between scientists and lay audiences. And they say, despite renewed interest in public communications, little systematic work has charted the landscape to date. So that's why they did this survey. Uh, they say we needed a clear picture of scientists' involvement in and attitudes towards and abilities to pursue science communication. So what they did is they interviewed uh, they have 6,242 responses from tenure track scientists at 73 colleges and universities within the U.S. land grant system. Oh, Dixon left. I was <laughs> going to ask him about the land. He knows all about the land grant system. I can tell you a little bit tell about me, it. Tell yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> because you um, land grant, uh, you know, is just uh, this. The, I, the, well, Dixon could probably tell us more, but there's land grant institutions. I know Purdue is one, uh, a lot of them in the Midwest. But the interesting thing is that UC San Diego is a C grant institution <laughs> uh, because this uh, the Institute of Oceanography was founded long before UCSD was. It was okay. actually uh, probably part of Berkeley, but it was considered a C grant institution. Dixon, what's yes. a land grant institution? I'm, you muted. You're still muted. <laughs> yeah, I think they were established first to establish schools of agriculture. Yeah, they were. Yeah. Um, I so believe. I know that Cornell is a land grant school, and it's a private school also. It has both aspects to it. UC Davis, UC Berkeley, those are. Yeah, I believe it was started by Lincoln um, yes. to, to start agricultural um, education right. across the country. And at that point, every state had one um, because Cornell was New York state's. Um, that's, yeah. right. that's right. That's yeah. right. Growing, growing up in New York state, I had to learn a bit about, yeah. about plus, that piece of it. Plus every state now has an IT school as well. And that was done to keep the agri agriculture schools from falling behind in terms of technologies because, mm -hmm. you know, after the end of slavery, everything was done by machines. And that's the advent of the modern era of, um, you know, climate change and all that other stuff. Once that happened, everything so bad happened. So what is the IT school of New Jersey? Yeah. It's New Jersey Institute of Technology in Jersey okay. City. It's and an here excellent, it's, it's excellent the school. One, the one in Brooklyn in New York? What is it? Yeah, uh, that's right. But in Massachusetts, everybody knows that one. Yeah, everybody MIT. knows the California one. Most of them are well-known places, basically. You have one in Michigan? Absolutely. Michigan Institute Every state of Technology? Has one, so. <laughs> I can't have to use uh, that guy. Not well. <laughs> It's probably um, in Detroit. There, well, there's there's Michigan Tech way well, up might north, be it. That but might I, be I don't know one. if that's it. So they say the reason they did this because these are recipients of public funding steeped in founding trans traditions of public service. So they should be strong right. supporters of science communication. All right. right. So they, they, they did this uh, survey and they gave people questions. And the questions are, how, how important is public engagement to – you know, you, your university, your dean, your college, your department chair, <laughs> residents of your state. So, for example, um, how important is public engagement to the highest score? 60 percent was to your university. The lowest score, 23 percent, most of your colleagues. <laughs> That's exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's always a perk for the school to get on NPR or onto uh, some kind of a national news show, but it's, it doesn't really help the person that got on. <laughs> I mean, they further break it down by sex, by um, years since your PhD, et cetera, et cetera. But really, um, you know, your department chair is 40%, residents of your state, 36%. So this is asking the faculty what they think. So there's a perception that's not so important. 
Well, and it's interesting that the residents of your state who you assume are not necessarily, you know, your colleagues and the people yeah. in academics, they're the people who are, should be benefiting from some of this communication. It says that that's so low. Yeah. They don't listen. So then they ask, what's the, what's the objective of public engagement? And the highest score, 95%, ensuring the public is better informed about science, 88% increasing public trust in scientific community, getting people excited about science, 82%. They're all pretty high, except persuading members of the public to adopt a position or viewpoint was down to 31%. <laughs> so it's Well, which is maybe as it should be, that the, pub, the objective should not be to persuade yeah. people to have a particular yeah. position, but to inform. Inform them, make their own decisions, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's also surprising how many people that are not scientists do not appreciate what a scientist is. That's like Brianne's question, what is a virus? You should have easily asked, what is a scientist? <laughs> and I think a scientist tries to disprove rather than prove things, tries to find ways of finding fault with a model. And it, when you can't, well, then it probably is true, but we're still not 100%. Sure, and that's why it's very difficult to describe this to the public because what do you mean it's not 100%? If it didn't work, it didn't work. Yeah, but there's always the possibility that some other model might uh, disprove it. And yeah, we well, see lots of examples of that, right? All so, right, so uh, 98% of respondents participated in at least one science communication activity over the year, 80% engaged in adult focused activities like science cafes or forums. 50%, 53% indicated that pursuing public engagement is important to them and younger faculty placed higher importance on these activities, which, you know, makes sense. So they say faculty's reported participation and importance might suggest a supportive climate, yet their perceptions of the culture surrounding public engagement expose areas of tension. <laughs> I like that. That's also in the abstract. Um Faculty indicated they receive inconsistent messages from different sectors and leaders. Under half of respondents thought high-level administrators had made public engagement a priority at their institutions. Faculty respondents believe public engagement was not important to their colleagues. 23% I had mentioned that. And only a half of sci thought scientists who participate in communication are well regarded by their peers. Ouch! <laughs> Right. They're looked at as glory seekers and sometimes. And I've heard that term being used. That guy is always calling up the times that he's got a breakthrough or he's always, you know, or she, you know, they're just trying to grandstand this. No, it's so, just this to, idea to, that uh, the people who communicate with your colleagues think that you're not very good. Um, oh, right. Oh, I remember once I was being <laughs> I was being bring, brought to the airport by a host and I will not name the host, but he said to me, Vince, you used to do such high-powered research. What happened? Oh, sorry. <laughs> then you did this communication, and uh, I said, "Well, they, that's the that's the viewpoint." Um, this is this is high-power communication, exactly. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so it's an interesting dichotomy. Go ahead, Kathy. Yeah, I was just going to say, I wonder how this might change i mean so the the data for this were all collected long before 2020 yeah and having had a year of pretty intense importance of science at least virology uh would people's attitudes change i don't know it might which people might. that's the point well, this, yeah you know the ones that want to know about science they listen to science fridays they go to yeah, wednesdays sure. on public television they they listen to twib they listen to twib they listen to and the ones that have no use for it whatsoever, they're unconvinced no matter what you say. Yeah, that's, I think that's, that's too bad. I think that's partially true, although I think that there also is sort of this group in the middle who maybe were not super excited about science because they weren't sure that it played a role in their life. Um, and so they weren't going to necessarily seek it out before, say, this pandemic. And now suddenly they're like, oh, wait, you guys know some answers. <laughs> maybe, maybe I should actually pay attention a little you know, more. I, I love confronting somebody who says, I don't believe in science at all. I said, okay, give me your cell phone. <laughs> Hand <laughs> well, over your and, car. <laughs> you know, and then there, there are other things that have come along too, you know, like the Mars rover landing and the helicopter and new particles mm. in physics and things like that. So we can hope. 
you know, just going by the people who write to us, they're clearly very appreciative of us informing them, right? And they are engaged. That's true. And one must think that they may be representative of the larger population who doesn't listen to us, right? And many people say, you know, you're influence goes beyond people who listen because we tell people what you no, tell that's us. True. You know? I, I so, believe that's true. I do believe that's true. There's one more aspect of this study, uh, and that is they ask what faculty think of their own communication skills. <laughs> um, those oh. with past engagement experience saw, saw positive outcomes as audiences gave them food for thought, 82% agreement. Um, Perhaps reflecting overconfidence in their skills, 62% of scientists felt it was easy to adjust to different audiences. 66% thought it was easy to explain scientific facts to lay audiences. However, many found these tasks difficult or unsure. Of greater challenge was managing critical objections from audiences. 27% of respondents finding it difficult. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've had a lot of experience with critical objections and it's not mm -hmm. easy yeah absolutely so vincent don't you think that every scientist has to communicate to some group even if it's their own peers and to know how to do that is a technology that most people don't bother acquiring but i remember when i was at rockefeller i took a course on how to give a 10-minute talk and it took eight weeks <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's they skill. started out showing you everything it's that to, to do was wrong, you know, and then they they broke it down. Then they reassembled it. At the end of the eighth week, I was uh, confident that I could give a good ten minute talk. Well, and I think that people don't spend as much time thinking about different audiences as perhaps they could. Um, I know that as I spend time thinking about under, working with undergraduates and teaching undergraduates, I have learned more and more about assumptions I make about things that everybody knows um, that I quickly realize everybody doesn't know um, and that I need to stop and uh, really start to explain. Um, and so I think that Maybe at the beginning, you might think that it, it's easy, but in fact, modifying your ability to communicate for some different audiences is a challenge uh, that people sometimes overestimate. Absolutely right. The, the best audience I've ever had, bar none, was a third grade class that I had up in Roscoe, New York, explaining to them why insects live under the rock in the water and they, you know, the little kid said they can't live there they would drown <laughs> <laughs> now you have to show them that they've got gills and stuff so you know that that really you know you really don't think that that's where they came from oh that's interesting and they ask such great questions yeah, and they yeah. believe you that's the other thing they believe you when you tell them because they think you're older than they are and you know more than they do. So therefore, whatever you say is good. So you can imagine how often that occurs with information that's not so valid. I like teaching young kids. They're fun. Yeah. I love them. I absolutely love them. But um, I mean, the, the other aspect of us is that we were trained to do research and um, you don't get taught how to teach and you have to absorb it or, you know, be a natural. It, be a natural. You copy and a not good everyone, example. not everyone. Yes, <laughs> I, I agree totally. You have to look at people and say, that's not good, or that's really good. Right. That works. Like um, Eric Lander, he's one of my favorite all time mm -hmm. people to listen to. He doesn't assume anything. And the next thing you know, after the hour or half hour or 10 minutes, you know as much as he does about what he's talking about. And that's incredible. Yeah, he's a natural. He's a natural. It's a so really it's good to, good to emulate skill. people like that. But that's um, really exactly right. You know, I, I found that. When I was a student, I used to love giving talks and, and you know, when other people didn't want to do them, I would always want to do them. And then when I came here, I was kind of disappointed that there wasn't much teaching to be done. So I just sought it out because oh, yeah, I right. enjoyed doing right. it. Um, yeah. But I, I really enjoy teaching undergraduates. And um, I, but that, of course, we do more than that here. And I, 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 it's very, very satisfying to me to be able to reach a lot of people. Mm -hmm. They they say their conclusions that many faculty feel unsupported at these institutions indicate scientists and perhaps especially younger faculty face an uphill battle in pursuing the critical work called for by so many. Yeah, it's going to be hard because it's all volunteer, right? It's like what we do. We just do it on our own because you don't get much um, reward. I mean, I think, uh, you know, uh, Su Su's Janity Wasa's situation is beautiful where they said, we want this communicator 
and we're going to make a position for it. That's the way it has to be done. Universities have to make room for people who want to communicate and not say, you know, what you're doing is great, but it doesn't raise any money. I mean, <laughs> that's what I hear all the time, right? You know, it can't be all about that. It, it well, look where I'm at a medical school where, yes, it is all about that because you have to raise. It's easy to make money. All you need is a press. <laughs> so they say, finally, future research should address how institutions can support and encourage faculty communication efforts. Yeah. But who's going to mm -hmm. who's going to do that? Yeah. Do you get to report it on your annual report? Does it really get looked at when you go up for promotion and tenure? Probably not. No. It's, it's, it's equivalent to writing a book. <laughs> I mean, the closest thing is, you know, that the NSF has you do outreach things yeah. in your grant proposals. That's right. That's uh, very good. I wish NIH it, would do that. Yeah. Mm. I mean, fortunately, that's one place where being outside of a kind of research one institution is nice because mm -hmm. some of those things are things I report on my annual report um, right. that are valued a bit differently. It's Vincent, it's, it's ironic that you should have mentioned the NIH because I have many good friends that work there and for them to biocommunicate to the outside world, they need to jump through about 20 different hoops. They have mm -hmm. to get it approved by so-and-so and such and such and such and such. And pretty soon they just don't want to do it. It's crazy. Yeah. And a lot of good yeah. science, of course, goes on there. So we are missing out on a lot of outreach that could be occurring and that's just not so occurring. So NIH has, NIH has its own communication office. That's fine. But what they need to do is encourage in, independent investigators to communicate to some exactly. extent. Exactly. As, as the exactly. NSF does, like Kathy said. Now, that's right. A number that's of years right. ago when John Udell discovered TWIV, he loved it. He said, oh, you have to get NIH support. I said, Find it. Go ahead. Find it. I'll, I'll yeah, apply. Right. You find That's it. That's right. That's right. Nothing. There's nothing. He. he nothing. Is what right. about this? That's what right. about that? Nothing. There's nothing. There's no component. Zero. That's right. Even even in the private sector for NGOs, it's hard to get support for this. Right. It's funny. Charitable trust. Everybody uh, loves it, but nobody wants to support it. Exactly. <laughs> Although I shouldn't say nobody because we're getting supported by our listeners and. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm hoping you, we can do that more and more going forward. So I shouldn't right. say nothing, but it, this is an unusual situation, I think, because we've been propelled by the pandemic, and I'm not sure. Sure, I'd be sure. I'd be renting a studio with Daniel if it were not for the pandemic, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Right. So I, when you watch these uh, science shows on television, particularly uh, public television, you see who sponsors the shows afterwards. Mm -hmm. And these are all very, very big organizations or people with very deep pockets like the Koch brothers or, um, you know, some some large foundations. And uh, it's Skoll is a good supporter of biocommunications also. But, but they don't give out grants to individuals. They give them out to things like that, which have high visibility and it gets their name out in front as well. So it's got – it works both ways for the, the giver and the taker. <laughs> Whereas when you – you know, I have a reporter call you up and they want to, would you please tell me again what, and you tell them and uh, you don't even know what happens to that information. It's just disappearing down a black hole. So too bad. Anyway, that um, was an interesting um, assessment of our sure. field, <laughs> I think. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> Leave something to be, you know, the thing is that now most scientists understand there, there are podcasts and videos and ways of communicating, you know, writing and so forth. And they know a lot of people do do, do it. I think as, so this survey is interesting because they say the young people are more enthusiastic. And as they move into leadership positions, maybe that will help transform the whole landscape, right? They become chairs and deans and maybe that's the way to do it. So we'll see. Has the number of podcasts featuring science increased over the last like three years, do you think? Yeah, yeah, they have. Just along with everything else, of course, the podcasting has exploded. And, right. Um, but mainly because <laughs> there's money in it, right? People, advertisers can make a They're lot of money. Advertising, yeah, so that's um, true. You know, that's there's true. a lot of, it's a democratic medium, right? Anybody can do a podcast. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, it attracts right. a lot of people who just sit down and talk. <laughs> to a mic for an hour or two and people Isn't like to listen no that's not <laughs> and so but that, i think that's fine to be able to do that but the ones that get the advertising dollar of course are very few um, but they've propelled the whole field um, and yeah, i i think it's um it's one of many ways and 
it uh, it'll get better. But it's just for academics, it's tough. And I think oh. that that's I, as you have seen, people like to listen to us because they they have no way of listening to people who do research. So. I, I right. think for that, it's, it's a good... So, Vincent, I have a personal question for you. Mm. Why don't you tell the audience why you like doing what you're doing now? What is it about it that keeps you posted? I mean, you're up to how many twivs, how many twips, how many twims, how many... This You love doing this. So what, what, what would you say to somebody who would just ask you that out of the clear blue sky? Vincent, why do you devote so much of your time to this? It's the same reason I like teaching undergraduates when they say, I didn't know that. That's what I love. I didn't know that. That's that. a great response. That's a great response. I, I find that amazing that yeah. people say that. And <laughs> I, I learned this and that. I just want to teach people, you know, in the end I realize. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I went into science because I like doing experiments, but I really like teaching people. Um, it's, it's, a, it's more rewarding right. in the end, right? I that's that's why I do it. Um, I would agree. And I will do I, I this. Bet that Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I bet that one thing beyond the I didn't know that is the, well, what if you, you know, uh, that next question where you see right. them actually start to put things together. Sure, yeah. uh, sure. Harold W. Brown uh, taught me a lot when I was his technician, then his graduate student, and then finally his colleague. Uh, he's one of my heroes all of all times, and he taught the parasitic disease course at Columbia for many years. And one day he said to me, he says, young man, he's always calling people young man. He says, let me just tell you something about teaching and research. He said, research comes and goes. You can do something and work very hard at it, and you get no results whatsoever. And you're in a blind pocket, basically. He didn't use that word, but I did. He says, but when you teach as well as do research, at least you can be guaranteed 100 grateful students at the end of the year. <laughs> and that is the best guarantee about anything. So I have always looked at teaching as watching light bulbs go on, like Vincent mm. says. Oh, I didn't know that. That's a light bulb that goes on. Well, yeah, I, yeah. I had a severe disadvantage because I started my teaching at Columbia's medical school and all the light bulbs are already on. So I had to turn them up. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a very difficult task indeed. But every Every now and then somebody decided, well, how can I get involved in this field? How can I go on into that? And, I've, I've, you know, it's wonderful to mentor people into that kind of thing. And I'm sure you've had a similar experience, all of us. We've, that's why we love doing this. It's a gratification. Someone's willing to devote the rest of their lives to something you said to them. How unusual is that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, that's I, extremely always, unusual. I always tell people that one of the reasons why I love my job is that I get to spend my days talking about things I find cool with other people who find them cool and helping them realize the next thing that they might find cool to work on for their life. The, the problem here is that I love it, but I feel like an imposter because I'm not supposed to be doing this here. I'm supposed to be raising a lot of grant money and doing research. Okay. And it's very clear. And maybe a part of the reason why I like doing it is, you know, it's like an F you, right? <laughs> I'm doing what <laughs> I want. Contrarian. <laughs> um, but so many people here tell me, oh, I love that. It's great, blah, blah, blah. But there's no institutional appreciation, right, at all. So um, I, I, I should not be doing this here at a medical school, not to the extent that I do. On the other hand, I see how people benefit. So it just drove, that's what drove me. And I wouldn't do it any differently. And remember, Dixon, when I wanted to do this, I went to you because I know you like to teach, right? I love to teach. I said, Dixon yeah, I likes to teach. to teach, so let's get him involved in this and because that's what you right. need is for someone who... But I love to do research, to too. People. I love both of those things. And I looked at... If you don't do research, then you have nothing to teach. Well, that's true. <laughs> if, I don't think I would be any good at this if I didn't have yeah, you know, exactly. all the years of research, for sure. And the same with teaching, right? I think the researchers right. can right. make good teachers. Um, I mean, it's from the horse's mouth if you're the but, one that um, did the work and then you yeah, told them how to do that. No, no, I would I not. That's I would never. It's special. Quite I special. would never not do research from the start and, and do this instead. That's I'm good at this right. because of the research. But now I feel that this is far more effective than um, any research that I can do. And yeah, I, mean, I have I, to say that, look, I've kept the lab going because Amy Rosenfeld <laughs> – is doing the work and so forth. I couldn't do it without someone like that. And that can't last forever. So at some point I won't be here anymore, but I feel that I'm on grounds now with this, with the 
communication that I can go off and just do that. Mm. Yeah. So I think one other thing I'll point out on that research slash teaching front is that not only does doing lots of research really help improve your teaching um, and improve some of your kind of critical thinking skills in terms of a process um, that you can apply to your teaching and all of that, all yeah. sorts of reasons why teaching helps uh, you know, research helps you so much as a teacher. Um, I, I have to say that I think that my teaching helps my research all the time as well. Um, and there are always times where I will be talking about some, you know, interesting or basic problem in biology that's maybe a little bit a field from what I'm doing research on. And I'll be halfway through the slide and I'll be like, wait a minute, this is actually related. Uh -huh. um, and, and it sort of <laughs> helps me think about yeah, things in a sure. broader way and makes yeah. me a better researcher too. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Let's um, get less meta now. You know, we're communicating about us communicating. <laughs> Let's do some emails. Uh, Kathy, can you take that first one? Sorry, Amara writes, okay. dear Dr. Rock and Yellow and team, I've been listening to TWIV for several months now and greatly appreciate your work. I have a which shot dilemma, a very privileged problem to have, I know, and would be grateful for any <laughs> thoughts you might be able to share by Friday, April 9th, if Sorry. at all possible. Sorry, Sorry. we're a little late. <laughs> I'm in the phase two trial of Sanofi's investigational adjuvanted recombinant protein COVID vaccine and received my second dose three weeks ago, March 17th. I became eligible for an EUA vaccine in my area the day after the study began, but agreed to wait six weeks from the first dose so that the study team could still use my data, getting an approved vaccine no earlier than April 7th. Two days ago, I made an appointment to receive dose number one of Moderna on Saturday, April 10th, but today received the opportunity to make an appointment for J&J, &J, hence the <laughs> urgency. I know the best shot is whichever one someone can get first and would have been happy to get any of the three EUA vaccines. But since I unexpectedly have this choice, I'm not sure which is best to do in conjunction with the experimental vaccine. If I hadn't already received two doses of the Sanofi vaccine, I would choose Moderna because of the higher efficacy rate. However, I have had two doses of a COVID vaccine. The Sanofi study doesn't have a placebo. placebo. I just don't know which level I received. And it's likely I have produced antibodies because I did have side effects from the second dose. As such, would it be more advisable for me to go with the single shot J&J &J vaccine rather than getting four doses of a COVID vaccine within the span of less than three months? Or should I stick with Moderna, even though that might mean severe side effects with both doses? Is there any reason to think one formulation over the other, Moderna's mRNA versus J&J's adenovirus, would be better following the recombinant protein? I spoke with one of the Sanofi study doctors and he shared his personal opinion, but cautioned that he can't truly really advise me since we just don't have any data on someone receiving two doses of the phase two Sanofi vaccine followed by an approved vaccine because hmm. it's never happened before. I recognize you can't know for sure either, but as I weigh my choice, I'm curious if your team of experts has any thoughts or strong opinions. And I completely understand <laughs> if you're not able to get back to me, but thought I would give it a shot. Pun intended. Thanks very much, Amra. When did they stop giving the J&J? &J? A week ago, right, roughly? Uh, a little more than a week ago. That's right, that's right. Yeah. yeah. It's a, Friday, a week so, ago, Friday, yeah. Yeah, so you can write back and let us know which one you decided on. But I don't have a feeling for if you've gotten this Sanofi, two doses of the Sanofi um which let's uh, remember again, it's uh, adjuvanted recombinant protein. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, mm -hmm. yeah that's right. So it sounds a little bit like what the Novavax is yeah. in some way, but it's I don't know what the, delivery, <laughs> what the delivery mechanism is. Um, so any difference between getting that versus getting an mRNA based vaccine or a adenovirus vector based vaccine, I, I don't have a feeling for that. No feeling. I mean, if J&J &J were that still being used. No side effect. <laughs> if if J&J &J were still being used, uh, then well, uh, that if you, yeah. I don't think it matters to get two more shots, frankly, but if you just no, didn't want to have one, that overkill. would be fun. Overkill. But it's not. Although I heard today that the EU is going to 
start using it again for the AstraZeneca with a warning. With a warning that's that, right. That's you know, right. That's right. That's right. Kind of like smoking cigarettes, right? Oh, warning, on the, <laughs> yeah. warning on the box. Okay, so that's in, in Europe, and then we have yet to hear about the J and J here in the U.S. But we're not right. going to hear until at least the end of this week. Yeah, the, the, right. Daniel said the 25th is the last day where the people would have the symptoms who got the last right. doses. So then they'll make a decision. Can I ask whether any men have exhibited that clotting anomaly? Yes, at least have. one. At least one, okay? That I remember I heard reading about, about. about all women, and I no, wondered I think what that was a, all about. I think there's at least one that I saw. Yeah. All right. Um, Brianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Eli writes, Dear Twiv, I'm a long-term Twiv listener. For a change, I have something I wish to share. Since March 2020, a group of scientists and citizen scientists, Eterna, have worked on finding ways for better stabilizing mRNA against degradation. I'm one of the citizen scientists. With less degradation, cost of cooling could be cut and the vaccine would be easier to handle everywhere in the world. Potential lower doses could be used because the RNA isn't degrading as fast. Our aim the whole time has been to get our work used for the second generation of the mRNA vaccines. Plus, it will have relevance to all RNA therapeutics. I am hoping you would take a look at our new preprint. And he gives a link uh, called Combinatorial Optimization of mRNA Structure, Stability, and Translation for RNA-Based Therapeutics. Um, I have not yet had a chance to look at this. <clears throat> now, uh, But that sounds cool. Isn't it correct that you, you can now store the Moderna at their fridge for up to 30 days? Um, yes. Right? Yes. Mm-hmm. And I think for for Pfizer as well for a also, higher temperature, yeah, that's right. yeah. You can store it at maybe minus twenty for a while. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Hmm. So I don't know. I mean, maybe this would make it. It seems to me that the doses are used pretty quickly, right? So right true. now it's not an issue. True. Very true. Very true. Right. Yeah. So this is a way of um, hmm. A new RNA sequencing platform to systematically delineate in cell mRNA stability. We find that instability is a greater driver of protein output than ribosome load. I'm trying to see where the stability outside of the cell is. RNA stability in the cell. That's what this is about, actually. So, yeah, finding ways for better stabilizing mRNA against degradation. What Eli didn't say, in the cell, not just in the fridge. Right. So you get more protein. <laughs> In theory, yeah, that's so very, even if you use the lower dose, you get more protein. That is cool. That's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. And we'll, um, well, when it's published, we'll take a look at it. Uh, Dixon, can you take the next one, please? You bet. Mike writes, hello, Twiv hosts. Relatively new watcher to your show. A friend and a coworker turned me on to your show earlier in the pandemic and have been watching it ever since. Thanks for all the great information. I'm a computer programmer and have no experience in medicine or virology, so I've really enjoyed the info. I have a question in regards to hydroxychloroquine and how quickly this drug seems to be determined by the ineffective fighting SARS-CoV-2. Is there a chance that this drug with some cocktail combinations being tried, could have stopped both pathways for the virus? Was it ever tried in combination with camostat, mesylate? It seems like a logical step to me after watching your podcast. As someone with a statistical background, but no virology or medical training, I look at some of the hospital and world death statistics about hydroxychloroquine usage and do not see anyone really analyzing this data to the extent it should. I do understand that there are many factors that could affect the post-death analysis data that is being presented, i.e. age of population in developing countries using hydroxychloroquine. A few cross-immunity possibilities for other vaccines just to get started. The U.S. hospital system data is, of course, flawed in its own ways, too. No real form of control groups in both the Henry Ford and Hackensack Meridian data. In my untrained observation, it seems possible that a combination drug therapy might be working, yet not exactly understood. Is this a case of being fooled by randomness, <laughs> or is this a real possibility? I enjoy watching, and thanks again, Mike. Well, again, Mike, if you raise questions like that and you're a statistician, then I wouldn't dare question you <laughs> because I can throw statistical books as far as I can read them, and that's not too far. But um, everything is possible. 
But the data from common sense approach to use just hydroxychloroquine alone certainly didn't work. And in fact, it had some ne negative side effects that were pretty serious. <clears throat> and combination therapies with a drug that's already been deemed dangerous, I think, is uh, risky. And, yeah. Know, in fact, they were they were doing a, a combination trial with Chemstat, and they withdrew it oh, because oh, of the okay. issues with uh, HQ alone. Yeah. So, yeah. I, it might have worked, yes, because they would hit the two pathways as as you referred to. But we're mm. never going to know, unfortunately. No, I, I have a just better approach now. think it's unfortunate. I mean, the only reason that drug was used was, you know, based on that poor data out of France, which right. just right. wasn't right, and uh, you know, it got. At EUA without any trial at all, and that was a mistake. Right. There was pressure from right. the White House, if I remember. Uh, you bet there was. Then. But, you um, also remember that leader, all illustrious leader, didn't take it himself when he caught the disease. Um, well, that was a infection. good decision. That was a good decision. Right? <laughs> <laughs> he finally listened to Dr. Fauci. <laughs> I thought he had claimed that he was already taking something. Really? He did say he was. He says it's time for me to stop. <laughs> oh. That's what he said. I see. All right. So well, what's um, the status for remdesivir now, Vincent? Is that still being used for anything or well, not? Well, Daniel said it's not worth using because the price is too high and it's not so effective. I see. Um, and no and new antivirals have emerged on those scene during only this pandemic? Not, not a, well, the phase two of molnupiravir looked good and that's going to go. Oh. Through, that's going through phase three right now. So that okay. could be quite good because okay. that's orally available. All right. But, um, All right. Remdes, as far as Daniel said, remdesivir is not worth, you know, they were trying to give it earlier because it didn't sure. work in the hospital at all. No. And he, and the early administration didn't work as well. And he said for the cost, it's just not working. He, he's really big on monoclonals now, right? Uh, sure. Giving them as early as you can. So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate. But, you know, drugs are harder to make. You bet. All right, let's see, Simon. Anyway, but for Mike, um, I think the trials are quite clear and um, it just didn't do any good. And I don't know why we have to pursue things like this. Say, oh, did, was this a problem? It's not, it's pretty clear that it didn't work. Let's move on and it hurt people. So we can't, we can't abide by that. Simon writes, team, I just started listening to TWIV in the summer. I have no idea how I found you, but I did. Before the summer, I'd been looking around for resources to better understand the pandemic and how I should be acting. Since finding TWIV and the rest of Microbe TV, I have been inspired to learn. I religiously listened to TWIV and listened to some of the other podcasts as well, especially this week in Evolution. More than that, I've been listening to Vincent's lecture series and trying to listen to Brienne's as well. So much enjoying that I purchased a secondhand copy of Kirby's Immunology and a brand new copy of Principles of Virology. The latter is, by the way, beautifully written and illustrated. I'm just a Silicon Valley product manager in enterprise technology. I don't even know, what, what the hell is enterprise technology? Is this stuff you use in business, basically? <laughs> yeah, probably. I think so. I think it's something that's IT. Yeah, I mean, when you think about something, somebody has an enterprise license for something that they're okay. using it at the, yeah. Okay, oh, so as a product manager, and so if you want to buy 500 copies of Word, I'll take care of it for you or something like that. <laughs> Maybe more, uh, yeah, just, just like you may not understand what we say, I, I don't understand <laughs> some of these terms. Many years ago, I was privileged to visit Welcome Trust Sanger Institute, one of my customers, and learn about what they were doing. That was 20 years ago. And so I can see just how far we've come in only 20 years. Moreover, my son is 11 in sixth grade and in biology learning about the human organ system. So I've also got to work with him as he learned using Miller and Levine's biology. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you, Simon. Let's do nice. one more round, okay? Back to Kathy. Bruce writes, my six-year-old grandson caught COVID from his grade one teacher. The school sent a letter to his parents to get him tested eight days after he was exposed. He was positive, but had no symptoms. Then his family were all tested and all were positive. His four-year-old brother had no symptoms. His parents did get sick, but thankfully with mild symptoms. So my question that uh, my wife and I have had Okay, so my question. My wife and I have had one shot of Pfizer, but the next shot is not until August. We live in Canada. We want to get back to normal. Can we get together before August and maybe have a sleepover with the grandkids? I'm thinking the kids have already had it, so it should be safe. 
P.S. <laughs> I like your videos. Lots of good info. No, so uh, not worried about um, the kids, right? Worried about them. Yeah, but they've had one shot of Pfizer. One shot. Yeah, I think that's going to keep them out of the hospital. Probably, yeah. I would agree. Yeah, and yeah, they may get a bad cold, but that's, I mean, yeah, that's, that's sort of a question of what they're worried about. Exactly. I think so. Um, and I, if you, yeah. you know, if you're really worried when you get together, continue to wear masks. <laughs> you know, and try to eat outdoors. It'll be. Outdoors you know, is between a now idea. and between now and August, that's right. Um, that's right. things are warming up. Although not here today outside, but um, <laughs> if you, yeah, depending on when you plan it in Canada, you can potentially eat outside. Right. Rianne? sure. Michael writes, "Greetings, Team Twiv. I have been listening to Twiv since last fall when I first heard about this great podcast from Daniel. I am the chief medical officer for the Care Innovation Lab at United Health Group." I support the team of nurses that manages the enrollment and follow-up of the patients who participated in the clinical trial on bamlanivimab, for which Daniel is a principal investigator, PI. My team now helps patients arrange to get the bamlanivimab at civimab <laughs> sure cocktail at home or at outpatient infusion centers. I currently live in Atlanta, Georgia. It is bright and sunny today with temperature 82 Fahrenheit, 27.8 Celsius. By background, I am a cardiothoracic surgeon. You have a terrific podcast series, the best. I have listened to every episode for the past six months. And in every one, mm -hmm. there is a geographic reference, which makes me think, been there. I know this place. Last week in episode 740 at one hour, 31 minutes, three seconds, you mentioned Jersey City, my hometown. <laughs> Yes, so it really seems to be this week in geography, twig. And curiously, there is some geographic link to every one of the hosts. Let me explain. Vincent, a while ago, you spoke about transferring specimens at the service plasma on the turnpike, the Vince Lombardi Plaza, if I recall, many years ago. Having been at these service plazas many, many times, I can just see it. Under a dim streetlight with Burger King in the background, a vial of polio virus changes hands. A car speeds off into the night, bound for an experiment in a lab across the GWB. <laughs> As an aside, I am listening to all of the online lectures for your Columbia course. These are really terrific. This is the virology course I never had. Thank you for your energetic leadership and your many contributions. Brianne, I started college right across the street from Drew University, Fairleigh Dickinson. I know the Madison Morristown area well. I hope that friendlies has survived and is still there for the college students and faculty. <laughs> it is still there. Rich, I changed colleges to Florida. Well, not exactly. I went past Gainesville and wound up, in my, wound up in Miami. Sorry, I wound up spending many years in Miami where I completed college, medical school, and residency in general surgery. After a two-year fellowship in cardiothoracic surgery, New Orleans, I joined the faculty at the University of Miami where I stayed for almost five more years. Go Canes! Go Gators, too. <laughs> Dixon, my parents moved to Fort Lee in the late 1980s. Based on your description of the view from your apartment, there is a good chance that you are in the same building or one very close. My parents lived in the Pembroke at 2077 Center Ave. Their apartment faced the river, the exact same view I hear you describe on TWIV. My mother was a regular at the Plaza Diner. I used to take her to the Assembly Steakhouse in Englewood Cliffs for special occasions. I understand that both have closed. I haven't been back to Bergen County much since my mother died a few years ago. Alan, you can't make this stuff up. I travel to Towson every three to four weeks to spend time with my partner. She moved there for work in March, 2020. I have been to Towson 15 times since then. I will be driving there later this week. We have been walking to the Towson State Campus, which is about a half mile away. Indeed, the photo attached to this email was actually taken in Towson last month. The objects between the coffee mugs are not really donuts. They are actually ginormous plasmids. Also, there is another geographic location to mention, Western Massachusetts. As a kid, I went to summer camp in Pittsfield, right on Lake Onada. Kathy, this is a little more tenuous at the moment. Apologies. I was supposed to go to Gross Point, Michigan in November to spend Thanksgiving with my partner's family. Her name is also Kathy. The trip to Michigan never happened as SARS-CoV-2 got in the way. Tentatively, Thanksgiving in Michigan is rescheduled for 2021. Everyone will be fully vaccinated, so maybe it will happen. My pick, Working on the Precipice. This is a terrific two-part series from JAMA. This is extremely well done. And he gives two links uh, to Working on the Precipice on the front lines of the AIDS epidemic at the CDC. 
um, which I definitely want to take a look at. This story is particularly compelling for me. I was a resident at the time that AIDS first appeared, but it did not have a name. In January 1982, I did a lymph node biopsy on a young man who was very ill with an unexplained illness. The biopsy showed Kaposi sarcoma. This was the first known case of AIDS in Dade County, Florida. I have subsequently taken care of many patients with AIDS-related complications requiring surgical care. Thank you very much for the great podcast. TWIV, aka TWIG, is the epitome of contagious, enjoyable education. Michael. Hmm. I like those donuts. They're, yes. They look like good donuts uh, amidst his TWIV mugs and TWIV screens and everything else. Nice. Right. And, well, I live in the same building that his mother lived in. Uh, I live in a building several blocks off from that towards is going west. The Plaza Diner is definitely closed. It was the best place to go for breakfast on Saturday morning. They had great <laughs> French toast, et cetera. And the, uh, the other, uh, the assembly uh, restaurant is closed. You know, restaurants last about five years and that's about it. <laughs> but the friendlies in Madison is still open. Right. Yeah, and by the way, uh, we're uh, classmates of sorts because I went to Fairleigh Dickinson and Teaneck. So, you know, I don't know how old you are, Michael, but I'm. Um, you can look me up in the yearbook. <laughs> yeah, and um, you know, I could perhaps make closer connections if you've had any connection with Cleveland, but probably Athens, uh, Georgia, to Atlanta. You know, we I could name all kinds of my favorite places in Atlanta. It being the best <laughs> big city near Athens. Um, so, yeah. One other connection, oh. Michael, my father was a cardiothoracic surgeon. Yes, yes, right. yes, wow. yes, 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 yes. Dixon. One degree you... of freedom. For, forget about Kevin Bacon. <laughs> <laughs> can you take the next one, Dixon? I can, I can. Danielle writes, Hello, Twilv team. Love, love, love your podcast. My career prior to graduate school was in clinical research. After undergrad, I worked as a study site as a study site coordinator on a multi-center surgical trial. Then I worked for a CRO, contract research organization, the contractors who do the research for drug companies, managing data for phase one and two studies. Finally, I worked on the sponsor side with a small biotech company trying to bring a drug to market that ended up not succeeding in phase three. In grad school, I studied biopsychology, but left the PhD program to homeschool my children and have been an unpaid educator for well over a decade. It is only because of Microm TV's podcast, Virology and Immunology, and Dr. B's JAMA Network podcast that I've been able to follow the pandemic without bias and misinformation. The world would be a re in real trouble if we had to rely exclusively on the media for facts. Thank you. When I look at threads from news sites covering uh, COVID-2, I find a widespread misconception that more people die from influenza than COVID-19. Now that the provisional numbers for the 2020 leading causes of death in the U.S. have been published, I created a weekly graph of COVID-19 versus flu deaths. I included the leading cause of death, heart disease, for perspective. Last fall, I wrote an essay um, my screen just moved. Last fall, I wrote an essay about why people were being misled into thinking few people were dying to see attachment, but no one was interested. At one and a half pages, it was too long and contained facts which people were not receptive to reading. It is my hope this graph is easier to understand, so please share it with anyone who might find it informative. Keep doing what you're doing. It's a great service for those struggling for accurate information, a rare commodity these days. Sincerely, Danielle. And she has this <laughs> riveting graph. It's a single picture, but it lets you see them almost a year's worth of COVID-19 Epidemic, a pandemic versus heart disease. And the flu is way, way, way down at the bottom. It's like a flat line almost. Well, nobody's been going out. So I think that's the reason why the flu hasn't done so well. But they went out enough to be able to catch this one. So I think um, maybe it's got something to do with hyper... Um, uh, <clears throat> no, I'm, I'm blocking on terms right now. It doesn't really matter. It's The fact is that this is, these are the facts and it's you don't have to use numbers or anything else to see what's happening. And... Um, you know, like Roseanne Rosanna said, if it isn't one thing, it's another. If we didn't have COVID-19 to worry about, then the flu probably would have been a problem. But since we did, um, it sort of is a trade-off between one and the other. But it's it's more it's more of a serious trade-off. More many more people have died from COVID-19 than from flu. Yeah, so, and if if this was sort of a normal flu year, it would not 
uh, be at these numbers that we see for COVID-19. Oh, no, no, that's absolutely right. Interesting absolutely that in right. April and last year and then the yeah. end of the year that the death yeah. succeeded the heart disease, which is the number one cause exactly. of death globally. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Interesting. Wow. Thank you, Danielle. All right, the last one, we caught up. Look at this. Well, for today, anyway. <laughs> Mark, Mark writes, dear Twift team, I wanted to let you know that I was finally able to buy Fever and West Nile Store on Kindle. Oh, cool. I think your listeners will be interested as only used hardback and paperback copies were previously available. I started reading them, and they are fantastic books, FYI, and thanks for the recent episodes. So I, I linked to them on Amazon. They're both free. Now, it may be if you have a Prime account, there, but you can hey, get. Wait a minute! <laughs> you can get Dixon's West Nile Story or Fever, which I highly recommend. Free zero zero. Maybe I should get it. By oh, it's four ninety nine. What the hell does this mean? Free. <laughs> it's free for four ninety nine. Maybe it's free shipping. Oh, sorry, it's not free. It's it's four ninety nine for West Nile, which should be because you should get a little money from it, Dixon. I, that's how I've been getting is little. And fever is uh, six forty nine. Okay, I don't know what the free is. It's something you have to click. Let me see what they do. So oh, maybe think, if you become a Prime user, you can get it free. So oh, I think it's free days. if you have Kindle Kindle Unlimited membership. Ah, yeah, right. and if you have, if not, you get a thirty day free trial. Of Kindle Unlimited, then you have to pay ten bucks. I, I would a month. be interested to know who narrated my West Nile storybook. I don't if know. I had a choice, it would have been David Attenborough. Is it is it an happen. Audible also? I mean, it's an audio book. No, it's just I, it Kindle. might be. It's, it's might just be. Kindle. It's just Kindle. It's just I just I don't have an audio book. Well, anyway, they're available, okay. which is good. I do. I, I do have both, so I don't need to get them. I have them in paper. No. Cool. You have a signed author copy. All right, <laughs> I do. You you signed it. I did. Um, all right, let's do some picks. Dixon, what's up yep. this week? Well, it was an obvious one this time. It was hard not to pick this. This is the first flight of a man-made, a human-made object on another planet. It is the, uh, the helicopter. And I listened to a detailed <laughs> discussion as to why it worked. And by the way, they also included a little, a little small patch of fabric from the Wright Brothers 1909 original first flight machine. Wow. Oh, so nice. there's a historical connection between the past, the first flight ever on Earth, to the first flight ever on Mars. And vive la difference. The propellers of a helicopter, if, if you're not aware of this, do not uh, increase in speed in order to get a lift. They increase in pitch. Hmm. So if they're flat to begin with, they increase in pitch. There's more resistance. Therefore, the lift is bigger, and up they go. The size of the propellers on this helicopter had to exceed anything we know on Earth because hmm. the atmosphere is so much thinner, right. and it's mostly composed of uh, CO2. So they showed a prototype actually being tested in a chamber that had a one-third the atmosphere of Earth at a NASA research center out in Ames, uh, California. And it was amazing. I mean, the thing just took right off, came right back. It was like watching a drone. Um, so it is a drone, obviously, from, from our perspective. I have a question about it. I wonder who's controlling it. Is the, uh, <laughs> is the, uh, the, the, the Mars rover that we have there on the surface doing this from a pre-programmed program? Or is somebody in NASA sending instructions to the helicopter because that's like a six minute delay or something like that. So watch out for that rock. And then of course it's too late because six minutes later or five and a half minutes later, the thing smashes up into the cliff. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know how they would um, accomplish this. By the way, it's only a 10 minute flight and it only went 10 minutes, uh, 10 feet uh, in the air. It didn't circle or anything, but it took pictures Mm -hmm. And seeing Mars from just 10 feet up, we've never done that before either. So these things have huge potential for mapping and um, getting the fine structure of something uh, recorded. Imagine if they had drones flying all over Mars, uh, you know, every four hours or something. And the next thing you know, you've got a, the most detailed map of any other planet besides Earth that you can imagine. So I was, yeah. I was, I did this one mostly for. I, I just I'm just amazed at how far that industry has gone since its invention. That's the way to put that, I think. 
uh, the astronomy picture of the day chose the video today too. And they also uh, mentioned that it could be useful to look at Saturn's moon Titan over the yes. next few decades. So yes, going yes, beyond yes, Mars. yes, yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. Wow. It's just Absolutely. generally inspiring to see it's that all the things scientists fabulous. can do. Fabulous. Yes. The regret is, of course, it will stay there after it uh, fulfills its useful purpose. And so it's just one more piece of junk after it stops working. <laughs> mm. That's a horrible way to look at it, but it's what we do. Brian, what do you have for us? Um, so I have a short animation on vaccine efficacy that explains what 95% efficacy means and how that is calculated. Um, so if you are trying to explain to someone, um, for example, that 95% efficacy does not mean you have a 5% chance or five out of 100 people who got the vaccine um, got infected um, and got COVID-19, uh, it's a really nice little animation. It's a minute and a half long um, that goes through with little balls uh, of different colors showing you vaccinated and unvaccinated and infected individuals trying to show you exactly how uh, this is calculated. You know, we 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 uh, went over this like a year ago. <laughs> to it. Yeah, because it was too early, so, yeah. so nobody remembers. But we explained yeah. it back then. This is great because our class tomorrow, our last class, is the students submitted questions about SARS-CoV-2, and one of them was, "How did they calculate this?" And I found a really complicated <laughs> paper for them. It's a it's a it's a good student, um, but this will be good for the for all of us. Cool. Yeah, very cool. Kathy, what do you have for us? I picked, uh, not too surprisingly, because I do it a lot, um, astronomy picture of the day from Sunday. And it is one of the most amazing APODs ever. And I sent it to lots of people and they wrote back and were just amazed. It is a, it's called Rainbow Air Glow over the Azores. So first of all, the whole sky is a rainbow. And then you see the Milky Way and the caption just goes on teaching you one thing after another. There's gravity this waves. This is beautiful. And you yeah. and then you mouse over it and it shows you the constellations and it labels the where oh, the gravity right. waves are. It's just wow. fantastic. So wow. if you're not driving and you're watching the YouTube video, make a point of uh, checking out this uh, April 18th, 2021, astronomy picture of the day. Just Azores. wow. It nice. is gorgeous. The Azores, wow. Oh, nice. yeah. And the, and the, it describes what the colors come from sodium and oxygen, um, mm. um, OH molecules. And uh, yeah, it just keeps on giving. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Um, That's a <laughs> okay, my pick. Uh, last time I picked uh, Next Strain, and Alan Dove asked about GISAID or GISAID. I, I did. I asked about the relationship between the so two. So I yeah. thought I'd pick GISAID, and I just was just trying to look up what it stands for. That's, that's why I said wait. <laughs> Global <laughs> Initiative on Sharing All Influenza Data. That's what it stands for. Ah. Um, so it was established originally for sharing all data from influenza viruses. And then, of course, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, was added. So those are the two data sets that they have. Uh, it includes sequence and related clinical and epi data, uh, geographic and others, a lot of data. And they say in the, in the front, it says, G just say does so by overcoming disincentive hurdles and restrictions which discourage or prevent sharing of virological data prior to formal publications. So it's nice because not only does it have the sequence, but it has other information like there's an article right up front on the re recommended composition of influenza virus vaccines for the 2021-22 Northern Hemisphere season, which is going to be this fall, right? You know, and, and uh, they're being made right now, um, just announced. So you could read all about that. And, uh, you know, they have an archive of all the <laughs> influenza vaccine recommendations for looks like the past 10 years or so, and many other nice articles as well. So that's gisaid.org, Global Initiative on Sharing All Influenza Data. I don't know. It's it's a hard acronym. Just say I don't know if it's GISAID or GISAID. Is it GIF or GIF? Yeah, it's another <laughs> debate. 
<laughs> anyway, um, and we had um, a, a listener pick from Michael, right? Yes. yes. Our, yeah. our surgeon friend. All right, and that will do it for TWIV 746, microbe.tv slash TWIV. Send your questions and comments to TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you would like to support us, microbe.tv slash contribute in your support now will soon go into supporting our studio space here in manhattan which um daniel and i are going to rent it's going to be called the incubator you know uh, anthony said we needed a name like andy warhol called his <laughs> his place the factory so uh amy suggested the incubator which i think is a great name it'll be Parasites Without Borders and Microbe TV. I'll have a studio there. And that's where I'm going to do all the recording from. It's going to be like a dream studio and hopefully someone to help me <laughs> do it as well. So Yeah. And, and I mean, also sometimes in some ways this money has to go toward the storage and the uh, fees mm -hmm. and so forth mm -hmm. that you yeah. pay. So. Yeah, the storage yeah. of the files and the, the hey, everything. There's all kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, domain names, blah, blah, blah. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, that it's and then it will be. This is going to be. Um, it's two blocks from Penn Station. So when people Exciting. come in, they, I'm going to take yep. the train in. I'm I'm not going to drive anymore. I've had it. And I'm, I'm going to go there. <laughs> and then when I have to come up here, I'll come up here. But I'm going to spend most of my time down there making more content. And um, I'm really excited about it. So kind of the next phase of. Um, and the space is beautiful. It's perfect for, it's it's a big space. It's got a studio room and then it's got a bigger other space with windows looking west. Uh, so very cool that we were able to do that. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon de Palmiers at trichinella.org, thelivingriver.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. I look forward to visiting you and perhaps even uh, occupying some of that space. Well, you so. could sit there and schmooze, you know. I do that a lot. We're going to have furniture. <laughs> we'll have furniture you can sit on. We're going to have, I think, a conference table. We're going to have, uh, I'm going to have um, a coffee machine, a, a water cooler. What's Sounds the, good. There's, oh, a little fridge. Yeah, I need to get a little fridge to put stuff Absolutely. in. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Just get a full-size fridge. You think? <laughs> yeah. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I could do that. And then there's this, actually a space. There's like a storage area. Where and I a microwave oven. That. Don't forget that, too. That's going to be part of it. Well, then I'm going to have to get a counter. That's right. That's to right. Put that on. But, yes, that can all be taken care of. Um, so we are just – Dan is about to sign the lease, but we're – they're going to do some work. And they were trying to get a quote for the rug because the rug is old and it's, <laughs> it's shredding. And so I said, need a rug because that really dampens the sound. And they, like – Got a quote for thirty thousand dollars to put a rug down. It should mm. be so. I Amy called Home Depot, and they say, "Yeah, we'll do it for six thousand dollars." So I have to go down there to Home Depot and pick a rug. <laughs> well, it's fine. I'm, so? I'm not complaining. I um, I just think it's funny fine. that I don't think they wanted to do it. That's why they priced it at thirty thousand dollars. Yeah, probably right. right. Probably right. All right. Uh, that was Dixon. Brian Barker's at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. And I look forward to taking the train in to coming to visit the studio, too. <laughs> <laughs> Take it in and bring your students so they can see some I will. science okay. communication. Kathy Spindler's at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. And when you visit New York, you should come by, too. Of course. I would happily do that. Of course, you would come here anyway if you were in New York. Actually, though, you did yeah. come to New York and you didn't come visit once, I know. But that's fine because I think it was on, uh, well, it was on the weekend or something like that. Yeah, right? it was not convenient. Yeah. But you. Um, yeah. that's a very convenient. I'm uh, Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. I can hear the music kicking in now. It's like I'm so used to editing at this point. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>